everybody? I know we're running a little bit late. I don't know where Bill is, but <laughs> Dave has disappeared, so I imagine he's being handled and guided here personally. So I just wanted to say hello, and I know we're running a bit late, and I'll make it up to you with a wonderful Q&A that's going to be really fun. I know it's going to be really fun because Bill is so much fun. I, I have a quick anecdote. I actually met him very briefly yesterday. He was walking by the panel, and I was covered in sweat. I loaded in, loaded out in Toronto, set up the entire booth, and I was just exhausted. And, and there he is, and I say, hello, Bill. I'm... I'm Andrea, I'm gonna be doing a Q&A with you tomorrow. And he said, oh, and he comes in for a hug. And I was like, oh shit, I'm hugging Bill fucking Mosley. <laughs> and, and I said, oh wow, okay, we're hugging. Cause I had kind of gone for a handshake and he's like, oh, I hug everyone. And he looks over and sees one of those little round garbage cans and he gives it a hug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> you know, the garbage, probably smelled better than me. I can't even believe that's the case. But that's how I know this is going to be a super fun panel and uh, and uh, I see him. So uh, let's do this. I am Andrea Subasati from Rumored Magazine, the Faculty of Horror podcast, the Batcave YouTube channel, but who gives a shit when you're going to talk to a living legend? Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Bill fucking Mosley. Yeah, it's, Cali it's California. We hug every, you know, I mean, not, not indiscriminately, but we hug a lot in California. Well, welcome. Welcome to you, Bill. Welcome Thank to everybody, you. actually, to the first ever Rue Morgue Dark Carnival. Is All everybody right. having a good time thus far? Yeah. yeah. Tell me, how does a graduate of journalism from Yale wind up in Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2? Well, that's a very good question. I actually, uh, is this on? I don't think that's on, guys. Have you guys no, I project. Have... Well, it's a very good question. <laughs> there we go. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm enjoying my Dorito breath. Yeah, that's all right. Um, well, it's a good question. Hello, everybody. Um, I got the part of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 uh, because I spent a summer in 1984 working on a ranch in Wyoming. And uh, I was working with a kid who was about, I think he was about 16 years old at the time, a uh, future drug addict, as it turned out, uh, who uh, at that time was into sugar. Um, he would uh, go into what I called sugar deliriums, and he would start speaking in tongues, he would sing commercial snippets, he was jingles and cartoon characters, and all this stuff was coming out of him, and I would just you know, chop my wood or dig my irrigation ditch, whatever we were doing, and, uh, and turn a deaf ear to him for the most part. And one day, uh, he was, you know, off on his sugar delirium, he was going, Aunt Captain Crunch, rawr, you know, and just doing all this crazy stuff. And all of a sudden, out of his mouth came the Texas Chainsaw Manicure. And then he just like kept, you know, back to Captain Crunch. And I went, whoa. And so that stuck in my head. I went back to uh, the bunkhouse. I uh, penned about a five minute uh, short called The Texas Chainsaw Manicure. And um, uh, actually I, I came back to New York City where I was living. I was on the ranch for like a summer, kind of a physical break from New York. And I gathered some friends in 1984 and we went out to uh, a hair salon on Staten Island called Sonia's Hair Fashions and uh, took it over one Sunday afternoon and shot the Texas Chainsaw Manicure. And it's basically the story is a woman goes to a beauty parlor, gets her hair done, sitting under the dryer. The beautician says, would you like something else? She goes, yeah, I think I'll have a manicure. And so the beautician calls to the silver door, of course, a sliding silver door in the back of the, the, back of the, um, uh, the, the beauty parlor manicure and all of a sudden you hear this saw start up and the door slides open and out comes Leatherface and storks over to this woman who's under the dryer and she's you know freaking out and he starts sawing on her hand she's screaming and you know she passes out from fright as he's sawing away on her hands and then uh, she wakes up they, they kind of bring her to and she she goes oh, 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 oh. 
oh. <laughs> and she has a fabulous manicure. And um, <laughs> so she goes out, she's very excited, and she goes out to the, the pickup truck to her husband, played by me, uh, as a cameo, and I did a cameo as uh, the hitchhiker from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm -hmm. And she goes, look, honey, I got the best manicure ever. And I go, hey, that's great, honey. We should celebrate with some head cheese. <laughs> now, I don't know if you all know what head cheese is, but it's basically, it's like, it's like a cold cut, I guess, but it's a composite of everything that you know, isn't used by, of the pig from, you know, after you've gotten the lamb, the, the chops and the pork chops and all, all the ham and everything, all that's left is basically the tail, the lips, the jelly, the eyeballs, and that's all kind of compressed into head cheese. And so, uh, you know, I actually went out and bought some for the shoot, and uh, in one take, actually, I even licked the head cheese, which I don't recommend. How did it taste? Pardon me? Was it more heady or cheesy? Uh, you know, it was actually just kind of slimy. And you know, it's like from, you know, the scrotum, I don't know what the heck it was. <laughs> not, not good. But anyway, uh, it's a long story, but uh, a friend of mine actually uh, saw the Chainsaw Manicure, and uh, he actually was an, an old high school friend who had made good as a, as a writer, as a uh, screenwriter in Hollywood. He, had, he and his partner had, uh, had written uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And so he had a nice big deal, and he was, uh, he, it turned out he and his writing partner were across the hall from Toby Hooper, who was uh, at Paramount Pictures at the time doing, um, preparing uh, Poltergeist. And so uh, my friend uh, took, the, took a copy of the Chainsaw Manicure, walked it across the hall to Toby's office. Toby watched the, the Chainsaw Manicure and, uh, and loved it, and especially loved the part, you know, that my cameo is the hitchhiker. And so two years later, um, I got a call one night from the screenwriter Kit Carson, and he said, uh, where would you like me to send a copy of the script? And I said, what are you, what are you talking about? He said, well, Chainsaw 2. I said, oh, you know, and so I gave him my address and uh, sent a copy of the script, said, you know, keep an eye on this character called Chop Top, and I uh, went, okay. So I, I read it and I thought, God, that's a big part. And, uh, and I thought they were going to maybe fly me out to Los Angeles from New York and I would audition. I wouldn't get the part because I'm not really an actor, but at least I get a free trip to L.A. And then uh, the next call was, um, do you have an agent or do you want to negotiate your own contract? And I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> and I had met an agent at a Christmas party, so I called her and said, would you negotiate? And of course, that's free money. So she said, sure. And uh, she called me back. She said, you know, um, well, they, they want you to play this character Chop Top. I was like, wow, that is insane, based on, you know, my little cameo in, in the Chainsaw Manicure. And uh, she said, you know, that's the good news, and then there's some bad news. And I said, well, what's the bad news? She said, well, they're only going to pay you scale. And as a writer living in New York, I was making maybe, I was averaging maybe $250, $300 a week um, writing for magazines. and. Um, and I said, well, geez, how much is scale? It sounded so bad. And she said, well, it's about, I think it's about 1800 a week. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I think I can handle that. <laughs> and then, then she said, and they want you to shave your head, uh, you know, because they want to stick a plate on your head or whatever. And I went, yeah, okay. She said, well, wait a minute. So I told them you would, you know, be missing out a lot, a lot of acting work. So um, they've agreed to pay you $5,000 to shave your head. I was like, oh my God, that's insane. <laughs> oh God, so that's how I got the part. That is an amazing story, and I think if, if there's something we should all really take away from that story, it's if you want to make it in, in the movie industry, you need to write a short on a ranch in Wyoming with a sugar fiend. Is that Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the sugar fiend. Pretty much it. And we're Facebook friends now, the sugar fiend and I. The sugar fiend. Yeah. So as the role that launched your career, did you play Chop Top? exactly as he was written, or did you have some room to improvise? Um, I had a lot of room to improvise, because I'm not sure if they'd even finished the script by the time they were shooting. Uh, Toby Hooper was in the middle of a three-picture deal with Canon Films, and um, I think that the three, the three films he did were uh, Invaders from Mars. No, actually it was Invaders from Mars. He had done Life Force for them, then he did Invaders from Mars, and then uh, Chainsaw 2. And so um, he, was, he was actually editing Invaders from Mars 
when he was directing, you know, at night by day he was directing Chainsaw 2. But I think that the script was a little bit incomplete. And so, um, and also Toby, for some reason, thank God, uh, just, you know, loved me. I, he just, you know, as Chop Top, not as, you know, me, but um, he just loved Chop Top. So he would just uh, sit there and, and let me and, and I'm sure other actors as well really kind of, you know, run with it. Like uh, one time there was a, there was a scene uh, in the radio station, very hot, very close. You know, that was back in the days of actual film and the cameras and bright lights and everything. And um, I was actually, uh, this was the scene where I'm smashing poor LG on the head with a claw hammer. And, uh, you know, blood's coming out of him and he's kicking and, you know, sp and I'm spitting and I'm, you know, making up all these things. And so uh, I was just like, you know, wailing on LG going, you know, if I had a hammer and a one and a two and a three and incoming nail and just doing all this, just making up all this stuff. And um, some of the times, you know, we, we'd cut because the hammer I was using looked like a claw hammer, but it was made of foam rubber and it, the core of it was like a coat hanger wire. So, I mean, it had, it kind of held together, but every once in a while I'd get a little carried away and then the hammer would twist like a pretzel. <laughs> So they'd say, you know, cut, you know, reset the hammer. And poor LG is lying down there, Lou Perryman. And uh, Tom Savini is right off the camera line, pumping away with his little, his little blood pump. And there's some kind of a tube that goes up through LG's hair and comes right to his hairline here. So all this blood is spraying, so they have to keep cleaning him up. And, uh, you know, it's, it's hot and, you know, I'm, finally we're doing like, you know, take 12. And I thought that went pretty well. And uh, and so uh, Toby said, Toby, Toby said, yeah, well, right, that was good, yeah. Well, you know, let, let's just try one more. And I was thinking, you know, we've done this a lot. And so I was thinking, of course, being insecure that maybe I was doing something wrong. So I said, Toby, am I am I doing something wrong? And he goes, oh hell no, Bill, I'm just having fun watching you. <laughs> so, like, yeah. So when you hear that as an actor, you know, you got to be pretty happy, and you know, it fires you up. So. That's got to be a good sign. Yeah. I have to admit, though, the reason I asked you that question, I was kind of feeding you the opportunity <coughs> to take credit for Lick My Plate. I did make that up. You did. I, I did knew make it. That up. I knew it. I made up Lick My Plate, You Dog Dick. I made up. Um, <laughs> uh, I made up uh, E X I T. Exit. Because I was, I don't know, I was channeling uh, Sesame Street. Uh, <laughs> Isn't Lick my plate, you dog dick. You know, Kit Carson, though, had some great, great lines. I mean, like, death eating a cracker. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, like, death eating a cracker. And that was, you know, so Kit, Kit had a lot of great stuff. And, uh, you know, but again, it was just, uh, you know, what I realized on that shoot, which I've taken into most of the work I do, and that is that, uh, you know, we're all basically serving the production. You know, I'm not the guy that needs my Perrier at 64 degrees, and I'll be in my trailer. You know, basically, we're all there to serve the production, whether you're craft service, whether you're the lighting guy, the, you know, the lead actor, the extra. We're all there to serve the production. And I think on, on Chainsaw 2, um, there was a, a lot of that kind of camaraderie in place. Like, we were all, because everybody was fired up, because this is, you know, this is the sequel to the, you know, the greatest horror movie ever made. So we were... You know, we also had a sense of mission, you know, it was like, holy shit, man, we're working on Chainsaw too. So that also really made it, uh, you know, fun, but, you know, energized everybody. And, and I found that um, my favorite part of acting is when you are able to just get out of yourself, you know, and just kind of be a character. And when you, when you make it to that place, uh, you know, which doesn't happen all the time by any stretch, but when you make it to that place, anything that you do come up with kind of is the character speaking, not you kind of figuring something out. So that, that was also a lot of fun. I, I don't think I've ever had as much fun making a movie as I, as I did with Chainsaw. So I'm, I'm going to skip ahead of it. I'm going to have to do that a whole bunch. I know you guys are full of questions. I just kind of want to <laughs> bang off the big ones. I think it's safe to assume that your role as Chop Top made a big impression on a filmmaker called Rob Zombie. Are any Rob Zombie fans in this room? <laughs> so just a few. Um, now, your role as Otis in House of a Thousand Corpses bears a striking resemblance to Chop Top in a couple of ways. Like, did it feel like a return to a role? You know, I thought that that's what Rob wanted when he hired me as Otis. I thought he wanted basically his own version of Chop Top. 
And uh, but God bless him, he uh, he kind of pried my fingers off Chop Top. You know, it's so funny when you when you've got you know, you're known, especially for one particular role. Um, uh, you know, you, you tend to you know hold on to it a little tight, <laughs> you know, like chopped up, like it's like your I don't know, it's like your uh, flotation device when the, the ship is sinking. You know, you want chopped up, it's chopped up, and so I thought that Rob wanted chopped up, and so I remember kind of doing a little chopped up shtick when I was doing with, you know working with Otis, and, and Rob, God bless him, he. He saw a different character. He wanted Otis to be much more of a kind of a hard ass, you know, sexy, you know, almond brother type character. And um, you know, I remember him first turning to me. We were watching the Super Bowl at his place. Um, uh, I guess it was maybe 2005 when we shot the movie. So it was you know back in Jan or Feb. And uh, and he said, you know, we're doing this. I want to do the same Devil's Rejects. And I want. Um, you know, I want you to play Otis. Um, you know, I want you to, uh, you know, kind of look like an almond. And he, he drew a picture on a paper plate of, you know, this kind of almond brother character. And I just remember thinking, you know, I, uh, I've never grown a beard before. I mean, this guy's got a beard. And he said, well, just, you know, I just stop shaving and see what happens. And, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, I mean, like it took a couple of months, but this beard came out of my chin. It had been hiding in my chin the whole time. And I, did you negotiate for that this time? Like, no, no, although they did shave my head for that. Uh, and I got I got less, actually, this time. Uh, for for Devil's Rejects, I got uh, $3,000 to shave my head, which uh, I don't know why that's somehow it's losing value. To me. I'm very glad because you know, the, the men in my family are bald. And so I think from shaving my head so much, I've got this all this hair. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, the, the point was the difference between Otis and Chop Top. Um, I think it can best be summed up uh, physically, if you don't mind me showing you. Uh, with Chop Top, Chop Top, the physicality is basically, you know, there is, yeah, you got to reset everything. <laughs> with Chop Top, you know, the energy is in this, kind of the center of gravity is up in the shoulders. So you got your coat hanger, you got your lighter. And, Hey, you lick my plate, you dog. You know, it's all kind of like, hey, you lick my plate. And with Otis, uh, Otis, it's all about the, the balls. So it's kind of like, you know, thumbs under the belt. It's like, you know, hey, fuck you. <laughs> it's right here. So <laughs> that, when I figured that out, then, you know, it was smooth sailing. It's all in the balls. You guys are like so many acting tips. <laughs> well, for Otis. Yeah. Um, now, going back to House of a Thousand Corpses and then Devil's Reject, I feel like they're pretty different Otis's. Otai? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm wondering if that was a conscious decision to tweak the character in a certain direction. Is that what you meant about kind of prying your fingers off of Chop Top a bit? Well, uh, no, I, actually the, the prying off Chop Top was really for, um, you know, the original Otis. Um, the second Otis became a lot more, a lot less confusing, I think. Um, you know, and some people prefer the, the you know, the, the albino, you know, crazy Otis. Um, other people like, uh, you yeah, know, the Devil's Rejects Otis. Um, I think that um, just, just to the point of the diff difference between House of a Thousand Corpses and the Devil's Rejects, what was interesting to me, I, I thought Rob was a really good filmmaker when we did House of a Thousand Corpses. I, you know, I loved what he did. I really enjoyed working on that. Uh, but then when he did, when he came back and was given, you know, by Lionsgate, uh, he was given the money to do a sequel. You know, I think the, uh, the the fact that he really changed everything so dramatically, and yet it was a, you know, a sequel, was really, that's when I thought, this guy is a genius. You know, that's that was the word, the G word came into my head. Because if you think about it, um, Devil's Rejects takes place, I guess, chronologically about more than a week or two after the end of um, House of a Thousand Corpses. You know, we've shot Sheriff Wydell and, and uh, poor Walton Goggins. And, uh, and uh, you know, now the, the police department is coming out to, you know, to avenge themselves on us. And uh, that was really only two weeks. In that time, uh, suddenly, I've grown a beard. I, I'm no longer an albino. Uh, you know, I, I look more like you know an almond brother. Um, and then it's also interesting because you know, in in the uh, in Devil's Rejects, 
Captain Spaulding, for the most part, is out of makeup. Uh, Baby only laughs, I think, once. <laughs> you know, that thing is gone. So a lot of that changed. And really what it is is more like a, uh, a violent crime picture than a horror picture, mm. a horror movie, excuse me. So it's, it's almost like he, he she, you know, not only did we change, but he also changed his genres, which I thought was just amazing. And because uh, usually, you know, a lot of times, as we know as horror fans, a lot of sequels to popular horror movies are basically the same movie, kind of reheated or, you know, with a few variations. But, um, you know, kind of a, maybe a cynical attempt to squeeze more money out of us. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, some sequels are good. But, but in the case of Devil's Rejects, it was like, wow, it's like a whole different movie. So that I loved. Okay, so I'll open it up to you now, audience. Any questions? <coughs> I have more, no pressure. Okay, there's one. Hi. I was just going to say, um, do you think it was because they were out of the house that made change uh, their comfort zone? Change the characters a little between the two movies? That's more of a Rob question, but yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. They just wind me up and point me in a. <laughs> Could be. It's another question. The, the Kihiki oh. Palms Motel brings out a lot of weird stuff. In <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Um, you've already given us a couple, but I was wondering, I'm sure you've got tons of them, but if you can tell us a few other of your most famous improvised lines. Any other off the top of your head? Well, yeah, off the top of my head, we, you know, go to Devil's Rejects. Um, you know, I've got Banjo and Sullivan in my van, or their van, and um, and driving to, uh, you know, we're going to recover some guns. And uh, we ended up, uh, this was in Lancaster, California, and so uh, they found that the location was a former uh, chicken farm. And I guess uh, the, uh, the owners of the chicken farm had just left you know, years earlier and just left the chickens and the chickens all died and turned into like chicken dust. So it was a, it was a kind of a freaky spot with all this chicken dust flew. And um, anyway, so uh, I'm walking with uh, Banjo and Sullivan and there, was, uh, there wasn't anything scripted between, uh, you know, the parking of the van and walking to, you know, the kill site, so to speak. And so Rob came up to me and said, why don't you say, um, you know, is that your wife's pussy stink on my gun? And I went, what? <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead and say it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, so I said that. I said, is that your wife's pussy stink on my gun? And then I added, uh, hope it don't rust the barrel. <laughs> so, you know, that's a, that, that was, I guess, a good example. It's a very Otis thing to say. <laughs> a question right here. With, uh... You're known for a lot of horror roles, Otis, like Chainsaw Massacre. Let's say we went back in time, and since you do a lot of great character acting, is there any major comedy roles back from in the past that you thought, hey, I would kick ass in that role? Not really. I'm, I'm too insecure. I don't really think, I think in those terms. You know, some actors like, you know, I want to play. I think the only thing I'd really like to do, and it's not really a, so much as a... Um, I don't think it's really a comedic, and maybe it is a comedic part, but it's in Shakespeare, uh, it's uh, King Lear, uh, the part of Edgar. Poor Tom's a cold! But I guess that's not exactly, you know, like, you know, comedy. I, you know, I, I play some comedy sometimes. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I find that, uh, you know, I'm very happy in the horror genre. Um, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, in Hollywood, too, there's also, you know, you kind of, you know, it's, people tend to get, you know, pigeonholed in a way. I remember I was doing a movie, it was a Disney movie called White Fang, and uh, I was uh, up in Alaska, and I was um, working with an actor named James Remar. So, who's a great, yeah, that guy. And he's, his, he's my pal, I'm his pal, we, we fished a lot up in Alaska. And I remember one day I was saying to him, uh, I was saying, uh, you know, I tease, uh, you know, I'm doing these, some of these horror parts, I, I hope I don't get uh, uh, pigeonholed. And he looked at me with kind of, I guess, kind of disdain. And he said, you'd be lucky to be pigeonholed. <laughs> so, I'm like, oh, okay. So, hey, I'm happy. You know, whatever, whatever work there is, I'm happy to do. Because I've, I've been to lots of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, more like pop culture shows and conventions. Um, 
where you have the, the science fiction fans and then the, the fantasy fans that have the, like the little little rubber dragon on their shoulder and they have <laughs> like a squeeze bulb in their hand and they can squeeze in the little thing. You know. <laughs> Give me horror, horror, horror. <laughs> no rubber dragons. <laughs> So we've covered Shakespeare. I think we should continue to peel back the apparent layers of Bill Mosley sure. to Bill Mosley, the musician. Could you tell us a little bit about the corn bugs? Uh, yes, the <coughs> corn bugs. Um, you know, again, thanks to Chop Top. Chop Top has brought me a lot of many, many of the blessings that I have experienced in my, that I've enjoyed in my life. Um, and Chop Top also was uh, one of. Uh, there's a guitar player, I don't know, some of you may know, named uh, Buckethead. And Buckethead is, uh, you know, I, I think he's the greatest guitar player on the planet. Uh, he is hes very shy. He's tall and thin, has long hair, and he wears a uh, white plastic face mask. And uh, he wears a Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket on his head. And good old Buckethead. Um, Buckethead... Uh, and I met, uh, I was doing a play in Los Angeles, probably in 1990, um, and it was a play called Timothy and Charlie, where I played Timothy Leary. There's a, you know, comedic part. Uh, and it was a, based on a, a, a historical fact, in 1974, one night, Timothy Leary and Charles Manson were uh, side by side in solitary confinement in San Quentin Prison. And so this play is based on that. And um, it turns out the guy that was playing Charles Manson was a friend of Buckethead. And I'd never really heard of Buckethead before. But uh, Buckethead uh, came to one of our shows. Uh, by the way, Timothy Leary came to like seven performances. He, he loved the show. Um, but uh, Buckethead, uh, I, I, I introduced him. I'd never heard of him. But uh, Buckethead uh, was a big Chop Top fan and wanted me to get together with him at his studio and, and go off as Chop Top on some of his recorded, you know, some of his guitar playing. So I said, fine. So I went down, I remember I had like a little cup of coffee and my bongos and went down to his place in Santa Monica outside of Los Angeles. It's, and uh, started going off as Chop Top on some of his tunes. And he liked that so much that he invited me to uh, come to New York and, and do some Chop Top on his uh, album Giant Robot, his Sony album. So I did that, that worked out. We just, you know, enjoyed working with each other. And I was just starting to go to conventions. And I was getting a little tired. Everybody has got their little 8x10. Hey, how's it going? You know, and so I'm the 8x10. I thought it'd be kind of cool to have something different for the fans. And so I said to Buckethead, can we get together and, and record some stuff? And, um, you know, that I can sell cassettes, you know, kind of needs me. Uh, uh, you know, and so uh, we got together and formed the band Corn Bugs. And uh, he knew a drummer as his friend uh, Mike, who, a.k.a. Pinch Face, because I guess he pinches his face a bunch of times. So uh, anyway, so we, uh, and we got together. We did, we ended up with about five CDs worth of songs, probably in excess of 60 songs. We never did a second take. Uh, everything was, you know, we kind of made it up on the spot. Sometimes I bring in lyrics, other times I just make up stuff and he'd just play. And so we cranked out a lot of stuff over about a 10 year period. Um, I think I have one, I have a Cornbug CD on my table and also a couple of DVDs. Uh, but it was uh, really a lot, a lot of fun. And um, I went on from there to do a band called Spider Mountain with a guy named Ronnie Sharon from a band called Stolen Babies. And, uh, and most recently, um, I just you know, collaborated with uh, Phil Anselmo of Pantera and Down. And we have a, an EP coming out, I don't know, in a month or two, uh, called uh, Phil and Bill, Songs of Darkness and Despair. So, <laughs> something, something happy for the kids. <laughs> It's like a good time. Yeah. And so these musical chops kind of got to manifest themselves in film a little later with the devil, uh, yes, repo. the Devil's Carnival and yeah. Repo. Yeah. I know we've right. got a Repo fan in the audience. Yes. Now, as I understand right. it, you had seen a production of Repo before you were approached to make the film. Yes, I'd, I'd seen I'd seen a show in like a little like a little storefront uh, uh, on Hollywood Boulevard uh, a couple of years before Repo. And I, you know, a friend of mine had taken me to their to the show, and um, stage show, and it was very cool. 
And then I heard, that, you know, then a couple of years later, I was with Darren Bowsman, the director, who was, um, it was a Fangoria convention uh, <laughs> in San Jose. And I remember, and it was kind of like this where, you know, there was, a, there was a, a wall. He was on the other side of the wall. And you kind of hear the sound coming through the wall. Well, I was finished with my Q&A or whatever, and I heard Darren describing his dream project, and he was describing this play that I had seen. And I went up to him afterwards, and I said, well, what was that? I think I saw that. And he said, yes, I directed it. It's called Repo, the Genetic Opera. I went, well, that's very cool. He, you know, finally, you know, he had done a bunch of the Saw movies, and so Lionsgate was very happy with him because he had made him a billion dollars. And, um, and so they gave him the money to make his dream project, Repo, the Genetic Opera. And it was so funny because he came up to me and he said, um, he said, I'd like to have you in the, in, in the movie. And I said, great. He said, you know, I know you can kill, but can you sing? <laughs> and I had given him copies of Corn Bugs. And I said, well, I, I gave you my CD. He said, yes, I know, but can you sing? <laughs> so uh, the good news is I've, I've taken uh, voice lessons, singing lessons, you know, for the, like the last 20 years in the valley and uh, every Wednesday. And so I, I, I can't, I can sing, as it turns out. And um, anyway, he gave me some, some, you know, the songs to prepare. I was to audition. Um, I auditioned for, uh, for Darren and uh, his music partner, Joe Bashara, for Terrence Sedunich, for Darren Smith, you know. And um, the audition was in, a, uh, was in a studio in North Hollywood. Um, the person before me that was auditioning for a part, not the same part, God, God bless us, um, in Repo, was one of the Pussycat Dolls. And, you know, she was owning it, and, you know, she was down, you know, we were in the, like, the booth with the window looking down, she was owning the song, and I was thinking, I am fucked. Because <laughs> oh, I'm like, you know, I'm nervous enough as it is. And uh, so anyway, they said, okay, Bill, you're next. And I was like, oh. And so, uh, but I went up and uh, he gave, gave me the headphones and I, I saw the guys all looking, you know, in the window and I'm like, oh, oh. And um, they started, you know, they did the playback, you know, it was kind of like karaoke, I guess. And, but you know what was amazing was that I had a magic microphone. It really, it sounded, it made my voice sound like I was singing in the shower. You know, it was like, whoa. And, you know, I was like, wow. And so I, that encouraged me, and uh, you know, and then they play the song, and I start singing, not quite like Lizzie Cat Bell, but you know, I started singing, and uh, when I was finished, they were like through the window, you know, I see these thumbs up, and uh, that's how I got the part. And so you had auditioned for the role of Luigi, and that's what you got. Yeah, that was my audition. Was could I sing? And um, what was amazing was I was I had never done a singing part before because it was all you know basically what they did was they recorded all the songs before we you know long before we came up to Toronto to shoot the movie and I was worried that maybe because it was an opera so all of it was sung and I was worried that maybe by locking into a certain emotion in a song you know six weeks earlier that I would then you know if I found something new I, I just didn't know how that was going to work in terms of you know, actually shooting the movie. And it worked out just fine, as it turns out. Uh, the one thing I learned was when you, you know, you've already, you know, when you're lip syncing, basically, it's good to sing the song. Because if you kind of try to just fake it, like, it just doesn't look right. So you kind of sing along to the track. And, uh, and it worked out fine. Um, Repo was, um, you know, it's so funny because it is, you know, it's loved by so many, and yet uh, really was hated by, again, by Lionsgate. And uh, they only opened us in about five theaters, I think, worldwide. And, uh, you know, it didn't, didn't go well. The, the critics were very tough on Repo because um, one of the stars was uh, Paris Hilton. And I think that was especially back then, that was kind of like, you know, the, kind of the kiss of death. Oh, Paris Hilton's in it. I don't have to watch it. It's just a piece of shit. And Paris Hilton, you know, I'll go to my grave saying that she was really good. She was very friendly. Uh, I thought she did a great job. She, you know, showed up at four in the morning to get her makeup on when her face falls off. And, you know, she, she kicks an ass. So, um, you know, I, I found that was an unfair criticism. And, and it's so funny that over the years, people have kind of, more and more people have discovered repo 
uh, because of the bad relationship, I think, you know, with Repo and, and Darren and Terrence, uh, they wanted to, uh, I think they wanted to do is probably do a sequel, I'm sure. Um, but I don't think Lionsgate was too keen on that since they had lost money on it. Um, so what uh, Darren and Terrence did was they made up uh, something called The Devil's Carnival. And The Devil's Carnival, there's now one and two. I play the magician in it. Um, and um, that's that they do own, so I think that kind of makes them a little happier. That, and I think they've probably been here, they have, I'm sure they've been uh, to Toronto with uh, the Repo Roadshow and the Devil's Carnival Roadshow. You know, they, they, Darren Bowsman is a force of nature. If, if he doesn't get his way, you know, things weren't working out with, uh, with Repo. And, you know, I think a lot of directors would have just kind of bowed their heads and, you know, and taken the punishment. Uh, but Darren said, hell no. And he basically got, you know, 35 millimeter copies of Repo, put it in a car, a van, and, and drove to different theaters throughout the country and, uh, you know, abroad, and just kept showing it and created the, kind of this Repo grassroots, Repo army. That was very exciting. I mean, uh, you know, and I think, uh, you know, that was one of the great lessons I took from Darren is, you know, never give up. Just, you know, if, if they're not liking it, just, you know, put it on your back and, you know, if the mountain doesn't come to Mohammed, you know, or whatever it is. And with Rob Zombie's movies, you kind of, you, well, you started to get a smaller role in Halloween and then now 31, you're not in it at all. I was wondering uh, what happened with that or if you're if something, you're planning on maybe getting back into something with him in the future. Yeah, I, I wanted the same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was funny how that works. Um, you know, as an actor, um, you know, you're always looking for work. And, um, you know, for me, and I'm sure I'm not the only actor that feels that way, you really kind of want to have something secure and ongoing. Um, you know, I ended up working with Rob on a lot of stuff, uh, whether it was music videos, whether it was uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, uh, Devil's Rejects, a little bit in Halloween, um, a little bit in Halloween 2. Uh, you know, I did, um, you know, part of that Grindhouse, the uh, Werewolf Woman of the SS, the fake trailer. And so uh, I think what happens is, um, you know, and it's a hard lesson to learn in Hollywood, and that is basically um, you, you can't assume anything. You know, that, that, you know, maybe a director is going to find some other muse or somebody else to work with or you know that part of their their life and times and um, you know it is it's uh, it's a hard pill to swallow sometimes but um, that's tough I'm still waiting for Toby Hooper to call me back um, <laughs> you know I did Chop Top in 1986 so it's this is the 30th anniversary and I and I've never worked it with him again you know we're, we're pals I'm great you know great friends with his son Tony you know, who did the all-american massacre and, but there is an expectation, like, you know, I think, I think the scariest thing for an actor, I mean, for me at least, was um, many years ago when uh, Sally Field got an Oscar, and, you know, they gave her the Oscar or whatever, whatever she was doing, and, and uh, she goes, you like me, you really like me, and that was so fucking scary, because, because of course, you know, it's just, it's all, you know, every actor is insecure, and, you know, do they, how was it, do, they, do you like me, you know, and so it is, I mean, uh, you know, God bless her, that, that, that frightened me, um, but with Rob, you know, I had um, dinner, I took uh, Rob and Sherry out to a uh, birthday dinner back in January, you know, so we're, we're cool, um, I don't know, you know, so, um, I'm only hoping that, uh, you know, it's somehow, some way, there's going to be, you know, another Devil's Rejects. He's not done making movies, so... Well, it was funny, right after we had... Well, he, I know he's not done making movies, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm thinking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's very funny, because after we had our dinner, you know, in January, you know, Rob, on, on his Instagram, posted a picture of the three Devil's Rejects on the road, you know, that iconic shot, and said, uh, would anybody like to see another movie with these same characters or whatever? And I think he got, like, 20,000 likes. You know, of course, we all want to see that. Um, the only problem with it is that uh, if he doesn't uh, hurry up and make that movie, you know, you know, me and Sid are going to be probably in walkers. <laughs> you know, and I don't know how sexy it is to hear. Hey, 
I'm the devil and I'm, I'm here to do the devil's work. Does it for me. Have you considered proposing marriage to Rob Zombie? Because I think that works well for getting into his film. <laughs> We wrap up. There was one over here. Go ahead. Yeah. Just wondering with uh, Repo, if you could just let us know, what was your favorite moment in the movie? Like, what was the most fun you had filming? It's your favorite moment and your least favorite. Uh, well, with Repo, um, you know, working, you know, I had a lot of fun moments working with uh, Ogre, uh, Kevin Ogilvy of uh, Skinny Puppy, who yeah. played uh, Pavi. And uh, we had a ball. We really had a lot of fun. Um, I also really enjoyed working with uh, Paul Sorvino, who was a very, uh, you know, kind of, kind of a crabby guy and until you get to know him, and he was just a, you know, a lot of, lot of fun. Okay.